odd one for you. Uh, here it is. Okay. We all have one back on me, and you can take this one here. You can take it home with you, okay? So the others have the um, manifesto, which we wrote a few years ago, and um, Critical Theory of Society and Religion. Is the title clear to everybody who got it? So these three have the manifesto. You have this one, right? Uh, so is there anything to be asked about the title of the manifesto? Manifestos are to be small, really, <laughs> but this is a big one. <laughs> Somebody criticized this. Yeah, I did. I did. Oh, you, you did. I said, uh -huh. you know, manifestos are pamphlets. You said, yeah. well, we're modern people now. We have more things to say. There's another critic there, too. <laughs> okay, Nailed what is it called from? Uh, it's Manifesto of Critical Theory of Religion and Society, and then the totally other, right? Um, happiness and freedom, I think, freedom, happiness, and the right. uh, rescue of the lost, what, what hopeless, hopeless, hopeless yeah. rescue of the hopeless. Rescue. I mean, does that make sense, this title? So, um, I think, uh, let me just explain the title a little bit. Um, there is the critical theory of society, of course, and, you know, the Frankfurt School and so on. And we developed out of this. That's our own work there. That means, you know, scholars in uh, Croatia and Europe and here and so on. We got this together, this critical theory of religion. And now we have reached even the Harvard level. We will have a co authored thing there about the same thing. <laughs> now, the first issue is this uh, totally other there. That is, uh, is that understood what that means, the totally other, and where that comes from? Um, the people, the critical theorists, Horkheimer, Adorno, Pollock, and so on, they were all Jews. So the first generation were Jews. Um, they also uh, were, had bar mitzvah, they were circumcised, and so on. So um, they were not orthodox, I think, but they were reformed, probably reformed, or what is called assimilated Jews. What does this assimilation mean? The Jews were in the ghetto for a thousand years. Sometimes they liked to be in the ghetto, and in any case, the others put them into the ghetto. They could not be part of the Christian community because it consists of guilds in the cities, guilds of carpenters, blacksmiths, and so on. These guilds had religious services all the time. They had saints which legitimated them. They defended part of this wall of the city and so on. So the Jews were excluded from these guilds. That means they were pushed into circulation. So you have production of shoes or bread and wine or whatever, and then that has to be sold on a relatively le low level of exchange. But in order to make a living, they had to go into circulation. That looked concretely that the farmers would use 10 pigs, and each pig cost 10 cents, and they drove them every Saturday to the wall there, went through the door, and went to the marketplace in the city. The Jew interfered there, and said, come give me the 10 pigs, you know, I will sell them for you, and I pay them for you, I pay 10 cents for each of them, and you go to the inn there and get drunk and enjoy yourself. And the farmers liked that, and so they took the little pigs just around the corner and sold them there for 20 cents apiece. That was profit. So in a certain sense, the Jews have something to do with uh, the development of capitalism, that means particularly merchant capitalism, finance capitalism. And then they took that surplus of money and gave it out as loans. Um, they could take interest for loans because the usury law was only valid for them among themselves, but not for others, not for Gentiles. They, they could take uh, interest from Gentiles. The farmers did not understand either the one or the other process. They took the loans and then they had to pay 
more than they uh, had taken. So they took from the Jew 100 talis, 100 talis, and they had to pay 120 talis back. Uh, the farmers did not know where these 20 talis surplus came from because the Jew had not done anything for them except giving them the $200. In the Middle Ages, people looked down on all salesmen because the salesman did not add anything to the value of the commodity while he was carrying it from A to B, and therefore they did not know why the guy took more money there. What it was for, they did not really see. When the Catholic Church changed the interest laws, they had a justification for it, and they said, well, the banks have to do some work. And so the interest of 2.1% is the payment for the work which the bankers are doing, or something like that, So, in order to justify that. So the fundamental thing in Aristotle and Plato and all these people is that they cannot explain the interest they cannot explain where the wealth comes from. It is unbelievable that Aristotle and Plato, who were such smart people, did not know that the wealth was produced by the slaves, that even the people who built the Acropolis were slaves. Their names are written, and the Empire State Building doesn't have the names of the workers, but they put the names of the slaves into the walls. You can see that there. You can go there to the Athene Temple. <laughs> and uh, so, the uh, uh, so this um, that was productive work. They understood, but the the manipulation as far as the market is concerned, the money and, and all that, it was strange. And out of this came all kinds of prejudices against the Jews, that they are lazy, that they don't work, they don't want to work, and uh, that they are cheating. I, I still my grandfather. They all told these stories in the countryside that they sold a cow with the, with the cow full of water so it was very heavy and then when the farmer took it away the cow got thinner and thinner all the time and so they blamed the Jews true or not for all these dirty tricks and when the, the, <coughs> this, uh, the Christian type of anti-Semitism changed into the biological one all these prejudices were in the background and gave the Jews a bad reputation which helped to, that one could do all these injustices against them. In reality, the Jews were not lazier than anybody else. If you see the Kibbutzim movement in Palestine, they worked hard there in order to build the Kibbutzim, of course. It was the Christians who pushed them into circulation and then punished them because they were in circulation. That was in, with pogroms all over the place and so on. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so the, these Frankfurt school people, they're from Marcuse and so on, from, came from Frankfurt, where I come from. Um, also Adorno came from Frankfurt. Also a great philosopher whom Horkheimer was related to, and all of them, Hock, uh, Schopenhauer, also came from Frankfurt. So Frankfurt was a very productive city there. <coughs> and um, the Jewish woman, I told you, the, Jew, the, the old woman who had to carry the suitcase, she belonged to that Jewish group. The rich Jews uh, were on the east side of Frankfurt, the poor Jews were on the west side of Frankfurt, so, but most of them were, like Fromm's father was a, a wine merchant, and Adorno's father was also some kind of a merchant, and they lived in a very nice area of Frankfurt. So, <coughs> nevertheless, now, with the French Revolution, where universal humanity was what counted and not the specific one if you were Jewish or Aryan or whatever. Um, the human rights declarations presupposed the universal uh, concept of man and on this basis the Jews then were granted human and civil rights and they pushed suddenly into music, into philosophy, into science like Einstein and so on. Um, the, the the guy who had the Manhattan Project, he, he was a was a Jew, and so on. so they were, did great things in music like Mendelssohn and uh, in poetry Heine and so on. So it's unbelievable if they had pushed together this creative force into the ghetto and suddenly it simply exploded. There Freud and Marx, they're all Jews and so on. So <coughs> and then of course came the um, the. Uh, you know, counter movement to it, a nationalistic and racist movement, and that led to uh, to the f uh, to the Holocaust and, and so on. So, <coughs> but the uh, accumulation.
situation meant now that they got out of control of the rabbi and that they thought on their own and uh, distanced themselves and that questions came up about the uh, Sipu Bible and um, they concentrated particularly on the theodicy problem already before Auschwitz why all these pogroms and these injustices happened which then climaxed in Auschwitz in the trial which they had in Auschwitz where they found God guilty of having betrayed the covenants and wanted to protect the Jews and all that happened to the Jews and so on. So it was over the um, over the theodicy problem or how uh, all benevolent and all powerful God how under him all these horrible things could happen the tsunami, the storms, the killing, the, the uh, holocaust, the wars and all the horror which we see in nature and history you can just turn on the nature channel oh there's somebody that's eating somebody and you can turn on the uh, histor- history channel there that somebody butchers somebody and so on. so that means they thought that in the face of the history they experienced uh, <laughs> such an idea of a divine providence or divine reason was um, was uh, simply unacceptable but at the same time strangely enough it was dialectical that means it was not an abstract negation but it was a concrete one while they rejected some elements of Judaism they held on to others and one thing they held on to particularly was the second and the third commandment of the uh, Decalogue of Moses and uh, they connected the second and uh, third commandment with Immanuel Kant, the great enlightener that means they built a bridge between religion and secularity and the enlightenment we said before that this union is the basis of the pathology of reason they tried to overcome one pathology that means this abyss between the religious and the secular and so they brought together Moses and Kant and then with Kant also other idealists namely Schelling and Hegel and then also Marx and Freud Um, now how can that fit together the second and the third commandment says the second commandment said not to make images of the absolute now all the gods of Palestine and Greece and Rome and Babylon and Egypt and so on they were all images so it was a very radical negation of all these images but not necessarily again an absolute one but a relative one that means the truth which was in these images was rescued in their negation see here I have a dialectical type of a sentence right you rescue the images precisely through that negation of the images in the second commandment so whatever you had in Apollo or here the Athena the little owl there and so on the meanings which are in all these gods they are not gods anymore they are relativized but their meanings are somehow rescued through their negation that is possible only if the negation is not abstract or absolute but it's only relative that means one can reject some things and one can at the same time preserve something so this is something which we, because it is not in our education, we have been educated as positivists, that we add this dialectical element without which it cannot be uh, understood. <coughs> now, this second commandment is very radical. The punishment which is there for Yahweh, he will punish people into the second, third, fourth, fifth generation down there for any violation, that means for any regression. And we have that in Islam too. Islam is radically. Uh, ideology that means radical eradication of the gods and that is why you had this poet there in London right to all the satanic verses Rushdie yeah Rushdie right because they particularly with him so uh, because uh, uh, Rushdie brought up suddenly female goddess matriarchal goddess of the Arabian Peninsula and he brought him into his story <laughs> and for the Islamic world the differentiation between religion, art and philosophy and so on has not taken place like in the West so we say the artist is autonomous the philosopher is autonomous and so, on. so the artist has the freedom to think 
to bring in religious things. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't want to hurt religion. It's just there has a differentiation. Differentiation is evolution. Evolution is differentiation. So uh, the West has gone through a certain evolution in which he has differentiated this. So therefore you can talk about the satanic versus about these goddesses, the three, uh, without wanting to hurt anybody. It took the American government a hard, long time to deal with that thing, and Rushdie has, is not officially anymore on the killing list of the state of Iran, but there are private people who have still <coughs> hold on to it, right? Khamenei rescinded it, Khamenei, the last yeah. president of the... the rescinded the it, yeah, right, yeah. But, but, you know but there are still private people who go sure, on with sure. it. Sure, right? yeah. sure. But this is also relative, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of my just a few back, uh, years ago back, when uh, Ahmadinejad had that, in Tehran, had mm -hmm. that Holocaust deniers mm -hmm. conference, and he did that specifically because he said, you know, you talk about freedom of speech in the mm -hmm. West and in Europe, yes, you have the freedom of speech to draw these pictures in Julian mm -hmm. Posten in Denmark, but you don't have the freedom of speech to deny the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. We don't have the freedom of speech to make these pictures that say they think yeah. about Jesus and Mohammed and mm -hmm. whatnot. But we have the freedom to deny the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and so we had that conference. So even that mm -hmm. freedom of speech is relative compared what to what was the right? outcome of the, of the conference? Do you well, know? all the Europeans and Americans and Canadians went to Tehran. And was there a result? That uh, didn't exist. That was the result. But the, but I mean the point being is that it wasn't Iranians for the mm -hmm. most part. It mm -hmm. wasn't scholars from the Middle East. Okay. It was predominantly Europeans who would be prosecuted yeah. under European right, law, right, EU yeah. law for yeah. saying that there, yeah. but they could say it in Iran. So th they denied the Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, with the same type of argument, you know, that the gas isn't in the right. gas yeah. chamber, and you know, you heard it all before. But yeah. Yeah. okay, so now this is very radical. The second one. Now this third one is not so radical. It is. Uh, it says to abuse the name of uh, the absolute. So that means you could have names which are legitimate in turn. But the Frankfurters radicalized it. That means no images of the Absolute, no names of the Absolute, total demythologization. But not in the sense of atheism. There is something, but we cannot name it, and we cannot make any images of it. So it is called the image prohibition strictest image prohibition and it's also strictest name uh, uh, prohibition so in a certain sense they were more radical than Moses Bilderverbot Bilderverbot, yeah and on the other hand the um, Kant now what is Kant doing Kant developed what is called the critical philosophy that means he was critical against British empiricism uh, Hume and so on, and he was critish, critical also in terms of French rationalism, and he tried to combine the two. And that means psychologically that he concentrated on a certain level of our mind, namely analytical understanding. So we have on one side sense perception, we see, we hear, we touch, and so on. That's the empiricists. And um, on the other hand, we have analytical understanding. That is what the French rationalists emphasized. And so uh, Kant brought together this empiricism and this French rationalism. Enlighteners are very often here called rationalists in opposition to the British empiricists. Um, so that these two things, and he emphasized this, and he um, developed then, he did a Copernican turn around Copernican turn. Now Copernicus said, you know, the earth turns and not the sun. Um, uh, Kant developed subjective idealism. That means what the naive onlooker thinks is real, the trees and so on and so on, it is really the product of the subject. He moved from the object to the subject and that means we carried in ourselves the forms of time and space of causation, of means and purpose. These were thoughts in us, and time and space were uh, connected with our senses. So when we look at the material, we right away, without being conscious of it, divide everything up, and that is, uh, collect facts and so on. The positivists think, you know, that the facts are real, but in a certain sense, the facts 
have a substratum, which is real, but they are also constructs of our own. Uh, that means in terms that we put them in a certain location at a certain time, and so this is all our own doing. And so he developed a whole logic, and uh, it was already to some extent dialectical. He brought the idea of a trinity back in terms of the uh, thesis and antithesis to do this. So that means he went back to the Platonic tradition, the Platonic Trinitarian thinking, he went back to Hinduism, which is Trinitarian. There in the book you have the three, three gods of the Trimurti and so on. So that is a new tradition which suddenly breaks through again. And um, But the important thing is now he limited analytical understanding and uh, there was something for him beyond that, but that belonged to the gods somehow. Um, he limited science, and he said that we have only finite categories with which we can only see finite things. He never denied the infinite. He was a Lutheran, a believing Lutheran in, um, in East Prussia. Uh, what is it called today? Uh, uh, Koenig, Koenigsberg. The Koenigsberg was the German name. Yeah, they have another one, Kaliningrad or whatever. Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad, Kaliningrad yeah, I think. Yeah, That should be, yeah. It's not proper. Yeah, we have to buy it back again, so. <laughs> 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 no, the is there, and the Russian honor him, too, the grave of Kant, so he's a universal type of a guy. Whoever is really educated has to go through the Kantian uh, turnaround there. Um, the, uh, our philosophy department never went, came to Kant there. They hired somebody from a post office and he taught Kant for <coughs> years and years. I don't know what has happened to him now. So there's something peculiar with us that they stay, you know, some derivation of the, uh, of the Aristotelian logic. So nevertheless, Kant. And so, but then, um, Kant said that we come our minds and our senses come to a certain limit, a concept of limit, and we are not allowed to step over this limit. His most ingenious student, Hegel, said, when you come to a limit, you are already beyond it. You could not call it a limit if you were not already beyond it. So that is then he reconstructed the moves of God and so on. But uh, Kant said the analytical understanding with its finite categories, which we have the natural sciences and the social sciences, we are not able to transcend this boundary. And behind this boundary, he called that the thing in itself. The thing in itself, if it has any determination inside of itself, then we could say it is God, it is freedom, and it's immortality. That means we are, what you have there about forbidding images and names, can't forbid analytical understanding to penetrate this realm of the thing in itself. So what was wrong with the metaphysical proofs of God? They all transcended this limit of our senses and our analytical understanding. Um, when Hegel wanted to go around, he had to mention that there was something more in us than analytical understanding, namely dialectical reason. Dialectical reason, when it came to the limit, could transcend the limit, and then we could think about God again. This is why he then could rescue the teaching of the religions, because the Enlightenment emptied out all the religious concepts. So you see, Christ is my Savior, Christ is my Savior. The thing has no content anymore. And you think on this tremendously rich theology about the Trinity or the saints or whatever, it has all been canceled. So the main effect of the split, the disunion between faith and reason was the total formalization of religion. That means it was freed from all content and it reached its climax in deism. Deism, the God has only one determination, he created the world, but then he left the world. And for all, pra that's our civil religion here, for all practical reasons, the world is atheistic and God is acosmic. He has no world. So when, you, when the God has no determinations, you cannot think about the God any longer. That is agnosticism, right? 
agnosticism means we cannot think about God with our methodology in chemistry, physics, and so on. This methodology stops where the senses stop. We cannot go beyond it. We don't say that there is nothing beyond it, but this something which is beyond it is beyond our categories, beyond other methodologies. That's why we must be agnostics. All your teachers on our campus are agnostics. Oh, even if they are theists on Sunday, maybe in the church still, they're schizophrenic, these guys, which is another type of pathology, then they are different. And now when you are saying something what has no determinations is also nothing, because we cannot think it, then you are atheist. Or you are pantheist. So when people didn't want to call somebody an atheist, it was a better name, euphemism, when you called him a pantheist. But in reality, the um, we can take Lenin's uh, differentiation for a moment. That means idealists are people for whom there is an a priori before nature, and the materialist is one who has nature uh, as, as a basis of things. So Kant becomes uh, uh, now limits the sciences. He could say, in a certain sense, he makes room for faith now, and. Um, the, you can have faith into, in God and freedom and immortality. As a matter of fact, he demands, and these are the so-called postulates, it's called the postulate, he postulates uh, that there must be a God, oh, and you have that in Beethoven, you know, the big symphonies, there must be a heavenly father, and so there must be, that betrays you already, he doesn't know it, uh, if there is one, but uh, he needs one. And so you need these postulates in order to live an ethical life, was Kant's position. And so therefore God, freedom, and immortality had to be postulated. And if you did not postulate immortality, you had no eternal judgment, and uh, no judgment day, as we have it in Islam and Christianity and, and so on, many religions. If you have no judgment day, then the earthly judgment is the only thing, but so many people get away with it. I mean, Bush got away, you know, one million people murdered in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and so on. This guy has now a nice daily pension, big pension, and a library, and so on. So, if that goes through, people know, you know, the earthly judgment, they all get away with it, and there is no heavenly one, or if freedom is denied, and we have total biologic determinism, like we said in Freud or whatever, um, and then, of course, the presupposition of all that is there is an absolute, and so on. So that means Kant said we cannot think about it with our sciences and so on, but we must postulate for practical reasons. We must postulate it, otherwise we cannot live a human life. And then he demolished all the proofs of God. He had great sympathy for the teleological proof because there must be some purposes. There must be, but is there? The empiricists did not see when they saw a bird carrying little uh, grass up there, that they could see empirically, but they couldn't see any purposiveness. They couldn't look into the head of the little program spell or whatever it was. So, therefore, they uh, threw out in the great natural science revolution of the 17th century, they threw out teleology. Um, you can only see the efficient cause as it pushes it up and flies up there and collects it, but you cannot see any purposiveness or whatever. So when you are really radical, then you cannot make that argument. There is, uh, <laughs> say that every finite teleology must presuppose an infinite one, and uh, we can see this finite teleology, therefore there must be an intelligent design. This recently that came up again in the intelligent design again. Um, this this type of a proof, what Kant would really, because in all these syllogisms there is a transition over the limit, and you cannot get over this limit. Therefore, uh, this is with the cosmological thing too. Whatever finite there is, it must have a cause. There are finite things. Therefore, they must be caused some, by something infinite and so on. Everywhere you have this transcending the abyss between the finite and the infinite, against which Moses and Kant both stand against it. And with the ontological proof of uh, of, uh, Anselm of Canterbury, uh, there you had from the very beginning the, the, uh, the unity of being and notion of thought and being. Uh, uh, the highest being I can think of must 
include also being, because otherwise it would not be the highest being. That is the ontological proof. But the already Gamelian and little monk protest against it, and Kant protest against it too. Um, so the rebellion goes from the thousand to to the eighteenth century. <laughs> the um, unity of an Adorno also they all deny this. The unity, in spite of the fact there are uh, elements of the ontological proof still present in the critical theory. Alkheimer calls Anselm of Canterbury a great thinker. Um, so the uh, but there is modernity means. Um, and then I think after Hegel's dialectical attempt was rejected to renew the metaphysical proofs of God and they be all, all me post-metaphysical uh, sometimes even positivists try to reconstruct it in Lansing there were, were some people who did that there who are you, who are you saying of Canterbury who? Anselm, Anselm of Canterbury Anselm, Anselm, Anselm okay. was of Canterbury yeah. Didn't, this, a lot of these <coughs> proofs of God came from Aquinas yeah no, 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 the Anselm of Canterbury, the, the church has not accepted, by the way, the Anselm of Canterbury position, the ontological proof. The church has only the, the cosmological proof, the teleological proof. But for Anselm and for Hegel follows Anselm of Canterbury, but then the ontological proof is the presupposition of the two others, because you have to have that thought already in order to prove the other two uh, secretly. So, nevertheless, all three of them have been destroyed by Kant. So, uh, we are not forbidden to, we are forbidden to make images of the Absolute, but also we are forbidden to think about the Absolute. We cannot penetrate it into the Absolute, because all our categories are finite. That is the decisive thing. So, in our religion department, we are concerned with religion, but we are not concerned with the Absolute. We have that with Schelling. You know, Schelling student was Müller, and Müller Schelling uh, was left longer than his friend Hegel, and he took his chair for ten years, and then changed into a positive uh, philosophy, and then our, our religion departments became positivistic, and still are positivistic. So in the Middle Ages, they were concerned with God. That was Anselm of Canterbury. In modernity, we are concerned with religion because we do not know anything about God anymore. Okay. So, how do you go from a Kantian radical iconoclasm yeah. and then say that you can create an ethical system based on it? Like he's postulating that in order for ethics to kind of exist, yeah, you need to postulate God, to do, freedom, yeah. and yeah. immortality. Yeah. How do you base an ethics? in kind of that radical iconoclasm. Well, I mean, his ethics is the categorical imperative in, in different formulations, right? So, and this is entirely formal. That means it has no content. From this time on, and all bourgeoisie is formal, because as soon as you bring content in, it becomes revolutionary. So, therefore, all, all the content is, uh, is left, left out. So, the categorical imperative says, act in such a way that your axiom, your particular axiom, can become the basis for universal legislation. But nothing is said about the content of the axiom, nor anything is said about the universal legislation. You have to get the content from outside and put it in. Say, for instance, if it is your axiom that you can take profits from other people and so on, can you make that in the universal legislation? No, you cannot, because if everybody will take profit from everybody, who the hell will do the work? So therefore it does not work. Capitalism cannot be justified by this formal ethics. But it is not intrinsic to that proof, or to that principle. But it has to be always be put from outside, put into it again. And that is true also for Apple and Habermas, who have this uh, communication ethics which says that a norm is valid if you get the consensus of the unlimited communication community. The unlimited communication community is a, fix, a fixation in a certain sense, a fictitious, fictitious in a certain sense, because you never get them all together, the nine billion people or whatever. Um, so, but uh, one main thing is that you have to include the victims into it. But this is as formal as Kant is himself, because you have to put something in now. So 
let's see, uh, uh, abortion, you know. Um, you have to get the consensus of the one and a half million abortions every year of these audit embryos. You have to get their consensus if you want to get uh, uh, make the, the abortion legitimate. So um, if, uh, if, of course, you need an advocate. The advocate has to speak for the little embryos. Now, if the advocate says, you know, you put me into existence and three months later you wipe me out again, that is not a very rational type of behavior. This is pathological um, to do that. So, but if, for instance, the embryo, the advocate would say, I will be born into an American slum and it is miserable to live, it's better not to live at all, I want to die, then you get the consensus and you could have an abortion. So. <laughs> kind of setting up a non-actionable system for ethics if you keep it on a purely formal le level. Yeah. And, and so I don't know what the function of a, an unuseful ethics is. Well, I mean, it is useful. They, they use it all the time, you know. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, we have that attempt. Habermas has it, you know. Uh, almost uh, all our liberals here have this form of formalistic type of an ethics. Because otherwise, material ethics, which would be the opposite, now, the Ten Commandments, that is a material ethics. You should not steal, you know, you should not kill. That has a content, right? Um, but, um, so this type of religious ethics, uh, I think that the bourgeoisie uh, was anticipating the fall of religion, really. The question was, you know, okay, now we have this absolute ethics there. The Abbe tells us what to do. What if people don't believe that anymore? And after the uh, French Revolution, you know, the, of course, the beliefs went back and back, and people believed it less and less. So therefore, they thought we have to, we still want to be ethical, even after the religions have disappeared. And therefore, they tried to make uh, ethics without theological foundation. And that meant it could only be formal, um, and it cannot be absolute in a real sense, because it has no foundation in the absolute. And why Islam and the Catholics for a long time, you know, rejected the human rights declarations was that they were man-made, that they had no theological basis, and the struggle is still going on today. Uh, and and uh, even the Catholic Church, the present Pope, you know, fights an outright struggle against all modernity again, like they did in the 19th century. So, um, and so, so you have these two positions on one side. Um, we come from a theological ethics. We know the determinations of God as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are determinations, so that means there's finitude in the absolute, which is rejected by the Muslims and by the Jews. And um, so, but it, it means that they are determinate. You can think about God. Uh, he is concrete. You know, there's something you. All the question art about the second uh, person in the Trinity, the second determination, the particularization of God, you know, in the creation and in the incarnation, incarnation particularly, makes all that art possible, you know, the baby, and so that even Kant told, uh, Marx told his children, you know, uh, we can forgive Christianity a lot because it gave us the worship of the child. And the child is not yet differentiated. So it is closer to the origin, and the child is a representation of the species, too. So, therefore, we can forgive Christianity much because it gave us the worship of the child. And so this concrete, the child, that means incarnation, you know. Where there is no incarnation, like in Judaism and Islam, this whole thing about uh, Jesus being born and uh, walking in the temple and being baptized, uh, all these pictures which make up the medieval art and antiquity art and modern art still even you know even the modern guys still have crucifixion pictures or whatever this is only possible because the absolute has determinations in itself the bourgeoisie wipes all this content out so if you have a sociological study and you ask who believes in God you have 99% of Americans believing in God and nobody has any determinations who that is because as soon as you say God is this absolute good, then you have the theology problem. How can Auschwitz happen when it's the absolute good? See, or the the uh, the determinations contradict each other and wipe each other out. Can you really be just 
and at the same time good, you know. If you are just, you have to put all these guys into hell forever, then it cannot really be good. And if you give good, you know, can can you really be just and so on, you know. Rudy, we've got 20 minutes. Do you want to put Yeah, okay. So, nevertheless, the, uh, we wanted to discuss the title, think a little bit about the title. So we have that background reading, and then also uh, find in the uh, list for the depth study one of these critical theories, and we thought either Habermas or, or Hannes, you know. But you are free to do other things as well. You can also uh, look when you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, in interested in literature or whatever, there are equivalents to the Christian uh, to the critical theory in poetry or whatever. So if you take, for instance, uh, uh, Beckett or so, Beckett is a poetical counterpart of the critical theory. You could even say that this is to some extent true for Brecht or for Kafka or so. And also you can see more drastically what the uh, pathology of reason may be when you read Kafka, for instance, you know, the trial or whatever. There you see the insanity of a modern bureaucracy, you know, you can see how it goes on in Western, uh, you know, university, you know, every meeting which we have, faculty meeting, I show them the pathology of reason there, you know. So, um, or if you did Baudelaire, I saw a movie last night, and they really mentioned Baudelaire, but it was, it wasn't a French movie, so it wasn't mm -hmm. nothing back one. Or Joyce, or Proust, Proust or, uh, you know, or Sinclair, Louis, uh, so the, the slaughterhouse in Chicago, whatever. They're all, they, all of them, describe in a more plastic way than philosophers or sociologists can the pathology of reason which is going on. So you can choose that, you can choose a priest or Kafka, Baudelaire, Joyce and, and Beckett would be good at Sigler or Desade for instance, you know, Desade was a nobleman who saw the insanity of the bourgeoisie, the third estate in its starting uh, when it started out Okay, so that is all today. So we want to look at the Sigo there for a little while and want to see. Uh, so the concentration of our discourse is pathology. Wherever we walk somewhere else, we want to come back to that in order to understand what that would mean. Because simply to say something is sick or whatever, that's too easy. So it may not be. So we want to see what that means, particularly how Hanneth and, uh, and also Habermas and look at it. Okay, so let's look at this movie there. And uh, does it work? It works. Okay. So, well, Honest books are to be here on Friday. Okay, so we have some translations then, right? Yep. And I can read them out to you if you want some, right? Uh, now, this guy there, to, um, Moore there, um, he's a Catholic. He goes to Mass every day. He was educated by the Sisters of St. Joseph, who have the hospital here and Nazareth College, which has gone under. But he was here, and he showed them the movie there. Um, he lives up north here, where there's some city there. Traverse City? Tra Traverse City, yeah, and Traverse City, yeah. And uh, he's making a new movie, I think. Um, okay, so let's just see to what extent he is there. He comes from Flint. Uh, his father was a worker, um, General Motors worker. Um, to what extent these movies reflect what we call the pathology of reason, <laughs> where it comes through? That's the pathology. Right there. Of yeah, we have not even started. There. <laughs> uh, during the um, uh, during the presidential campaign, he was there all the time. After the children were massacred, he. He, he asked him but um, he started out with Roger and Me, which was the first one 20 years ago, and he predicted a lot of the pathological yeah. things which have happened in the meantime. Yeah. Field dressing, Rudy. Do you remember huh? that? Remember field dressing? Yeah. Dog eat dog films. Yeah, there you have it. That's what happens in Asia. And that's the, the theology problem. With no help. See, you know, when you study pathology in medicine, it just takes the strong nerve, right? And when you study the pathology in sociology, that may also be nerve-wracking. So